transportation, implementing um, design and delivery standards. So I work for a college, so these design delivery standards, in terms of me, were presented to a, a full college, not just a department or an online program area, but the entire college. So as Denise said, I'm Dr. Katie Mercer, and I was hired as the distance learning coordinator. I also teach classes in public health, um, and that's at the Jim King Sioux College of Public Health at Georgia Southern. So a little background, why did we feel the need to create policies and things at our college? Um, you know, I'm gonna get into that in just a second, but first, there's a conversation that's happening around colleges and universities now, and a lot of it is focused on these four bullet points. So a lot of it is, is people's unfamiliar, unfamiliarity with best practices of course design and online pedagogy. They just don't know, um, you know, how to teach online. Um, they, they, they know how to teach face-to-face, -face, but they, they're just unfamiliar with, you know, what's the best way to deliver a course online. Another thing that I hear a lot is the, the evolution of technology. It's constantly evolving. I'm gonna learn one learning management system, but then next year I'm gonna have to learn a different one. So that's a big um, kind of a barrier and a, cop a topic of conversation I hear almost on a daily basis. Um, there's also third-party software such, such as Adobe Connect and things of that nature that's constantly changing. So a lot of faculty members and, and department chairs and you know, other administrators are, are really concerned about the, the constant evolution. Another thing is that there's faculty members and, and, and people that are instructors that have to come to terms with the loss of social interaction as we know it in the classroom. So you don't have a person sitting right next to you that you can turn to and speak with. So that's an interesting kind of conversation that we're having. Another topic of conversation would be academic dishonesty issues. Who do we, how do we know who's taking the test? How do we know who's writing the papers? So these are kind of um, some topics of conversation that I hear and kind of, you know, how the, the tone of the conversation as of late. So why did we as a college start to enact policy and create policy? Basically, there were three reasons. Um, we felt that we needed to tackle uniformity and training amongst our faculty members, uniformity amongst the courses that were offered online in hybrid format, and also who was trained and who still needed to be trained. So that was one of the major reasons why. Another reason would be accrediting bodies. So we have SACS, and then we also have for public health, the Council on Education for Public Health, which is CEAF. So a lot of, I know a lot of um, department areas or colleges also have their specialized areas for accrediting. And then lastly is program competition. If we're gonna have fully online programs, we need to have quality programs or else we're not gonna be able to compete. And that's probably um, the most you know, important one that we felt we needed to get a handle on this stuff so we could have good competition in this market. Lastly, in terms of background, the role of deans, assistant deans, chairs, and program director, directors can't be stressed enough. So the culture of need and importance needs to be created. And this is important for buy-in amongst other faculty members and instructors. So these administrators, this leadership really needs to be cognizant of the need and importance of creating policy so they can create the culture and set the tone for their college or department or program area. Also creating a position for someone like me in a program area or in a college, um, or establishing release time for an exi existing faculty member to just work on this as a dedicated job is very important. Um, it would be hard to create policy if you don't have, uh, you know, a release time or this isn't your dedicated job. So that was very important in terms of the role of dean, my dean, to actually create a position for someone like me to come in. So my process, I'm going to go over that, you know, just a little bit of an overview before we start. In depth. Step one, we have distance education policy development, so I'll go into that a little bit and what that process was like. Also training assurance, who was trained and who still needs to be trained. Um, step three would be the ID of willing Quality Matters review participants. Um, Quality Matters, you know, is what we, is what is the program that we kind of follow, the rubric we follow for good course design, so I needed to make sure I could find people that were willing to help review courses with me internally. Step four, organization and scheduling of individual and team course reviews. There's a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of people involved, and they all have different schedules. So this was actually a very integral part of this process. Step five, data collection. 
and evaluation of courses and then presentation of that feedback to the instructors and the or the faculty members. And then lastly, offer the plan offer of plan to help instructors implement changes. So closing the feedback, the, the feedback loop there. So that step six is very important. So I'll just dive into step one, distance education policy development. So I had to first start off with uh, looking at the literature and also consulting with my experts. Raleigh Way is on this uh, webinar with me, and I think Stacy Kluge is an attendee. And these two were or are continue to be very integral in, in my work, and they were experts early on to help me create this policy. Um, policy manual creation. This is what happens next once you've done the research. You've consulted with your experts. You have to then create a policy manual. And this is something that people can take with them, your faculty members, your instructors, and kind of um, glean their information from when they're creating courses. So this manual has my roles and responsibility um, at the college. So people know, you know that they can come to me for certain things. Also, it has their specific requirements for online and hybrid instructors in terms of what they need to know when they're creating courses, um, what training they need, et cetera. Next, development of, of internal modified QM course review process. At my college, we, we review courses using Quality Matters, but we have a modified internal process. So our, our group of people that have agreed to be participants in the, in the process meet as a, as a team in a meeting format around a table. We review a course in a morning or an afternoon, and then we're done with that course. We don't take a course, go out by ourselves, and then come back and meet. We simply meet at one time together and go through a course together in a morning or an afternoon. Continuing step one would be development of, development of internal course delivery and pedagogy review process. So every semester, I review personally every course for delivery and delivery pedagogy and, and um, course design. So um, that's interesting because I also have to find the time and you know figure out which courses I have to do that for every semester. So that was kind of the development of that internal course delivery and pedagogy re review process. And then in that manual, you, you need examples of evaluation documents and tools you're gonna use to look at these courses. That way your instructors or your faculty members can look at those tools and kind of craft their, their courses around those evaluation tools. That's proven to be very helpful. And then also that manual can have university resources um, in terms of where you get technical training, who you need, who you can ask for help, things of that nature. And then once the manual is created, you have to educate people on it. So I had to go out and, and, you know, and basically train my faculty members, my department chairs, and everyone on the different aspects of the manual. Step two is training assurance. So who has been or still needs to be trained in First, technical, technical skills. So we, we could be referring to the learning management system here. We can be referring to um, different third-party software such as Adobe Connect. They also need pedagogy, delivery of online courses training, and quality matters training. So this is in, in our college specifically. So there, there's um, a requirement of all the different types of training here. So what I, what I had to do is I had to go through and find out what faculty members had what training and who still needed training. And then that next bullet point says, I have to link all instructors with training dates and times to ensure ease of process and full participation. So I had to make it as easy as possible for those instructors to sign up for the training that they did need. Um, and I did that through reminders and things like that. And proudly, I can say that our college is, has a very high rate of training. Um, some things are 95% in terms of quality matters is 95%. All faculty members trained at 95%. And I think in terms of pedagogy and delivery, it's something in the, the high 80 percentage. So it seemed to have worked. Step three, I have to ID who's willing to uh, participate in these um, QM reviews. So in terms of the faculty members and instructors and, and other people that are in my college, I had to solicit um, people's participation for participating in these internal um, QM reviews. So I did that through email invitations, um, through individual meetings face-to-face -face with people. I walk around to offices a lot, and you know, basically, they could count some of this, um, these internal QM reviews as service, toward service. You can offer them a stipend if you want. Um, a lot of the people that I'm working with, they just simply said yes, they wanted to help, and they wanted to be part of the process. So you know, that, that is an integral part of this process in terms of course reviews. 
Step four, you have organization and scheduling of individual and team course reviews. As I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of moving parts when you're trying to create policy like this and implement and roll out policy. Um, the organization and scheduling is probably the most tedious. Um, first, the organization of data management files with courses to be reviewed, you have to make sure that you know which courses are offered, which semester, by what instructor, when, and their course numbers. And that's going to make things easier for you in terms of scheduling. Um, electronic files created that correspond to courses with evaluation documents. So every course that needs to be reviewed each semester has a file with the evaluation documents that correspond with that review that is necessary. And I keep everything in terms of courses in a folder for each semester. And I organize everything by semester. So um, that kind of works for me. So moving on with that same, with that same, um, with step four, scheduling of course reviews for fully online and hybrid courses every semester. I mentioned earlier that I review those personally. So I have to set a time aside or a day aside to complete evaluative reviews online each semester for every fully online course. And that's just me and my office usually um, reviewing the course online. And then I also for hybrid courses, I do that. I review the online portion every semester, but I also review their course the face-to-face -face meeting, one of the face-to-face -face meetings of their course. So I will schedule a time to go and witness their face-to-face -face meeting um, each semester. And so I will evaluate based on, you know, course design, delivery, um, quality matters, and then also a face-to-face -face, uh, peer evaluation of their teaching. Then lastly, internal QM reviews. When you have a team of people that are going to meet at a, at a certain time to review a course, you have to make sure you have the times, the locations, their schedules down. Um, and that way you can schedule those meetings. That proves to be kind of difficult in a lot of instances. And then you also will talk with uh, department chairs to decide which courses will, will be reviewed or ready to be reviewed during the upcoming semester. Step five, this is when you, I titled it data collection and presentation of feedback. When I say data collection, I mean gathering the evaluative tools together and then compiling that data. And that way I can go and present the feedback of those evaluations with, to the instructors. So I also keep that data for myself in terms of some, for each semester, and then I can track the effectiveness of what I'm doing in the college. So our data is not used for evaluative purposes by deans or department chairs. So it's really simply a feedback loop to help instructors uh, better their courses semester to semester. Continuing with step five, data from those evaluations is presented during face-to-face -face meetings by me. Um, and this is for reflection and improvement. Like I said, it's not used as an evaluative tool um, for deans or department chairs. But I schedule face-to-face -face meetings with every instructor or faculty member that I, have with, that I have evaluated that semester. And during those meetings, I go over a number of things. First, course development and delivery checklist. This has uh, you know, certain things on it that are related to development and delivery. Quality Matters Course Design Checklist. I will, I will go through that with the instructor at that meeting. I will show them examples of good course uniformity. We're trying to have a lot of our courses, all of our courses online uniform in terms of a college, so I'll show them examples of how that should look. Also, examples of good teaching online, I'll show them. We go through how-to worksheets during these meetings. So if, if faculty members or instructors want to know how to integrate audiovisual materials, um, narrated lectures, other, other videos, things of that nature, I can go through that with them at this meeting. Some people already know how to do that, and that's great. Those people that do not, I can go through that with them. And then also I show them how to create um, transcripts for every video that they would upload um, through YouTube. So like I said, some people already know how to do this, but if not, I go through it with them at that time. And then lastly, for the hybrid-only courses, um, I do also the peer evaluation of their face-to-face -face instruction checklist. I go through that with them at that, at that meeting. So those face-to-face -face meetings are very important, um, you know, in terms of moving forward uh, as a uniform program online. Closing the feedback loop is step six. I offer uh, to help instructors um, implement changes. I ask them, would, would you like my help implementing these changes? If they say yes, um, we have a discussion re regarding their abilities. What do they know how to do online? Um, what do they feel comfortable doing? And then also, I, I let them know what I can help them with at that time. Um, I can't 
I, it's me by myself. I don't have a, a, a graduate assistant. It's, it's just me. So um, the, these conversations uh, will be, you know, basically I can show you how to do certain things if you need to learn it, um, or I can show you where to get the training. That's probably what those are going to turn into. Um, but anyway, we can come out, come up with an outline of things that I would, would help them with and things that they would like to, 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 to do, do themselves that would increase, um, that would improve their course. Closing the feedback loop. Final thoughts. I can't, I can't stress enough the feedback loop. So it's important um, that faculty members know and instructors know that this is for th them to improve as instructors online. Um, and it's not served as an evaluative tool. But I do, I am there to offer help in case they do need it. I've, I've had, I have come up um, against a couple of barriers. Um, people perceive that this process is very time intensive. Um, some people have courses that don't, they, they don't need to be tweaked very much, and, and that's okay. So there's probably not going to be very much time involved on their, on their part. Um, some professors will have to change a lot. And so it, as long as I tell them, you know, I can help you along the way, we can get this done together. Um, anything that I can help you do, just let me know, kind of alleviates that barrier a little bit. A lot of um, instructors say that their academic freedom may be infringed upon. I like to tell people that I don't really have much to do with content. This is just um, course design delivery, things of that nature. So I, I try to alleviate that barrier as well. People say sometimes this is too hard to do, implementing these changes into their course. Um, putting AV materials, uh, narrating lectures, things of this nature, it's too hard. Um, I don't know how to do it. Well, uh, then again, I'm there to say I can help you all uh, every step of the way. I can show you tutorials. I can give you documents that I can leave with you that, that, that show you how to do it, that kind of stuff. That's how I kind of uh, face that barrier. And then another barrier, if you don't have buy-in from your faculty and your instructors, it's going to be hard to have an effective distance education professional because if they don't feel it's necessary, they don't feel it's needed or important, they may put it on the back burner. So I'm going to go back to that, that bullet point earlier when I said it's important for deans and chairs, uh, assistant deans and program coordinators to make sure that they build a culture of need and importance um, because that's what's going to get this, this feedback loop um, off and running and sustained. So. Who is doing this? Are, are any of you guys doing this? What's working? What's not working? That's the end of my presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Um, we have some questions coming in. And then for those of you who haven't yet put in questions, you can also answer Katie's question. So what are you doing? What's working? What's not working? Um, Katie, Robert is asking how many courses you are reviewing each semester. <clears throat> If you're talking about the internal QM review process, my goal is to review four courses a semester, and that will be a group of three of us reviewing, reviewing those courses. If you're talking about my individual reviews, I review every course that we offer online and, face, and hybrid every semester. So if we offer you know, seven one semester, I'll review all seven. If we offer 20, I'll review all 20. Okay, great. And then um, sort of, I think, along those same lines, Karen Watson, Molly, I'm going to get to yours in a second, um, but Karen Watson asked, how long do you spend in each face-to-face -face meeting? And I guess I, I had a question just with that is sort of, can you briefly talk about how those meetings, like what happens in those face-to-face -face, um, synchronous course review meetings? Sure. So interestingly, I haven't had one yet. So um, I have scheduled them to happen in April. Um, I wanted to inform all the faculty members about what we would be looking for in those courses. They all have been QM trained. So now they're ready for us to look at their course. How I, how I feel those, course, those review meetings will go is I will go in, I'm in every course review meeting. So it's me and two other people. And basically we'll, we'll open a course, we'll pull it up, we'll pull, open the, the course review management system and we'll go through each um, standard individually, and then we'll come back and talk about it as a group. Um, I feel like these some courses could take a full day. Some courses could take, you know, just a few hours. Um, but to answer your question, you know, I, I anticipate that being the process of those meetings. Okay, great. 
And Molly has asked, how much change is enough and sufficient? Change in terms of if the course is uh, not maybe up to par to making it par, is that what you're referring to? That's what I am guessing she is referring to. Um, that's an interesting question because in terms of my role um, as the distance education professional, I facilitate the feedback loop. I would love to see, you know, at least 80% change, but, you know, I feel like that's going to be up to maybe maybe leadership once they see uh, two or three semesters of this uh, in process. And then if, if we don't see enough change, which I guess I'm not answering the question because I don't know the exact you know, amount of change that we would be looking for. Um, it would be up to leadership. We could then go back and kind of change our tactics if that feedback loop isn't working or being as effective as we would like. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Karen Watson says she is doing some of what you guys are doing. I'm not sure. Karen, can you just pop in the chat field where you are from? Um, and Winona Hatcher is asking if you created if you created this booklet or the steps that you have just gone over today. I did, I did create it. This was just my process that I did at my college. Um, I kind of just sat down and um, operationalized them and, and, and wrote them out. I did that um, with some help with uh, of Raleigh and Stacy Cruz, like I mentioned before, who are on this call. Um, but it was just my process, my individual process. And so I just kind of you know, thought maybe people could benefit from my process. That's great. Um, let's see, Winona's asking what university, this is Georgia Southern, Winona. Um, and Jim Wilkinson is asking, how do you evaluate hybrid courses? Um, and I guess he's asking if you use QM for those. So interestingly, we do use QM. We evaluate hybrid courses just like um, they would be fully online, but then we also go to their face-to-face -face meetings just to make sure the face-to-face -face meetings complement the online portion. So everything that I use to evaluate the online course, I, I use to evaluate a hybrid course, and then also a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting, uh, peer evaluation of their face-to-face -face teaching as well. Okay, and Karen is asking if all of your reviewers are um, official QM peer reviewers. I would assume she's meaning like going through the quite intensive, I think it's a week or two week course. Um, well, um, I am peer, I'm a peer reviewer and one of, one of my other reviewers is a peer reviewer. Um, but the third reviewer, she has had APP QMR and the online workshop um, and you know some other trainings that our actual college has, our university has put on, but she is not a, a full peer reviewer, but she is very schooled in, in QM. So two out of the three are peer reviewers. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, what other questions do you guys have? You can either put it in the chat, as folks have been doing, or if you want to use your microphone, you can um, hit the little hand button, and that will raise your hand, and we will call on you. Um, and I just had a question while we're seeing if more questions come in. You talked about the evaluative reviews that yes. you did. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what those are? Sure. So on this slide, these are these are my evaluative documents that I use when I go um, and talk to the professors about their teaching and when I review their courses. So development and delivery checklist, that has a lot to do with um, kind of how the course is set up and how it's delivered. So are you present in your course? Do you um, have module titles that are descriptive? Um, do you have a quiz or some kind of self-check with every module. So that's what that document is consists consists of. Um, the next document is the Quality Matters Course Design Checklist, and this is the the official QM uh, checklist with annotations and, and set, et cetera. So I go through that entire document for every course. Um, examples of course uniformity. This would just be screenshots of basically one of our courses and how we want all the courses to be uniform and how they should look inside. Um, D2L or w what we call folio. Examples of good pedagogy, these would be, say, narrated lectures or, or video lectures that have uh, cool technology 
um, that kind of make it interesting that also um, are, are good ways of teaching online. And then the how-to worksheets, like I said, um, I have some how-to worksheets on integrating AV and then the creation of transcripts for accessibility using through, through YouTube. Lastly, the peer observation of face-to-face -face instruction checklist. So this is what I use when I go into the hybrid course. And basically it is a regular peer review form of a face-to-face -face course. And then we're, also, we're now in the process of creating a hybrid um, peer observation checklist. Um, basically, does this course feel as if it is uh, an appropriate complement, complementary uh, meeting of a fully online course? Things of that nature. So in terms of the documents and the evaluative tools I use, that, those are just some of the examples. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Um, da, da, da. Let's see, Prathiba, Pris, I'm so sorry. I'm sure I didn't say that right. Is asking what items are on the checklist for online and hybrid courses. And I'll just ask you to put your institution in, Prathiba, so that I can tell you if your um, institution is part of QM because you have access to that checklist. Um, Gordon State. Let me see if Gordon State. You guys might not be, I don't see you on my list. Um, so it's uh, the checklist that QM uses is copyrighted and super secret, I guess, <laughs> unless you are part of QM. But if you're interested in learning how your institution can become part of QM, you can email me and I'll put my email in the chat bar um, and I can help you learn about that. <clears throat> but do you want to, Karen, just sort of give an o general idea of what sort of things you look at with the um, checklist? Are you, which one are you referring to, the Quality Matters course design checklist? I think so. Okay, so well, with that. You use that, right? You use the official? I use the official one, yeah. So it's just the, it's the Quality Matters rubric, which is um, all different um, standards related to course design. Um, you know, is, is the course, does the course align, the uh, assessments, the um, tests, the, you know, all the materials that you use to teach, do they align? Um, is, are the course objectives written properly? Do you show, um, you know, privacy policies related to technology? all things that would be related to good course design of an online course basically is what the quality matters um, checklist has um beth is saying that and beth if you can put your institution in the chat bar we'll know where you're from that her institution has trained 179 university of west georgia great 179 faculty in qm and over 100 of them have completed a three course sequence sequence um, DYOC, APP QMR, and PRC. Ten courses have been certified through the official QM course review process. We offer pedagogy and technical training, but we do not have policy and procedures. That's interesting. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's great. And it's, what's really cool is to see how the different institutions are implementing QM. Some are going through the official QM process. Some have really developed their own, like you guys have. And, you know, I think the cool thing about QM is that you can customize it for a good fit for your institution as far as how you implement it. Yes, um, and the, the, the modified QM process is very important. You have to know your faculty and you have to know what's going to work, um, like you said, for your institution and, you know, my instance for our college. That number of people that have been trained at her university is very impressive. Um, yeah, Raleigh, it really is. Raleigh, Raleigh, do you have any, can you speak to that at our university? I'm not sure Raleigh can speak. Uh, well, yeah. He can't get his audio to work. Uh, we have those numbers somewhere, but I'm not exactly sure what, but, but I know that you guys have trained a lot yeah. also. Yeah, I'm impressed um, by, by our center. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I had my first training through them, too, and they were great. Cool. Um, let's see, Winona Hatcher from Augusta University said, asks that, as a peer reviewer, can you use the QM rubric as an official checklist, or do the faculty have to download the form? 
Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm not sure I do either. Um, you, you have to be, I'm going to answer a question that you may or may not have asked. Um, you have to be a subscriber to use the QM rubric. Um, and they have an online system, but I think you can, you know, if you're doing an internal process, you can just use it offline if you if you guys decide to go that way. Um, Stacy, thank you. Stacy says that Georgia Southern has trained 250 in APP QMR, and that 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 stands for applying the QM rubric. We have another question from Winona as well. How are you training the faculty, Katie and everyone? Are the trainings led by the IDs or the administration? Um, the trainings of, of the policies at my college are, are, are done by me. The technical trainings and the APP QMR and um, those type trainings are done at the Center for Online Learning and then the Center for Teaching and Technology that Raleigh Way and Stacy Kluge, um, they, that's, that's where they work. And so everyone goes to that hub for those types of trainings. In terms of the trainings that I mentioned in my um, in my presentation, I am responsible for training everyone on the policies at my college. And Winona, just so you know, um, in order to do the to train folks on the rubric, you have to be certified through QM. So um, if you have questions about that, you can send me an email, and I can send you information about that. Um, and Beth says, most of the QM training has been through QM online classes, but we are now offering our own classes via QM trained certified UWG faculty so we can offer better facilitation. While we think the QM rubric is wonderful, we don't care for how QM models facilitation. So just to say they, they are very um, prescriptive on how all of their trainings run and the, the reason is so that they can know that everyone gets the same training, but I do hear what Beth is saying, that sometimes it can be constraining as well. And I guess that constraint is what Winona's talking about, too. We've received QM training and our subscriber I completed the certified training as a viewer. However, I thought you couldn't use the QM rubric unless we went through QM. I guess I'm not sure why, what you mean by going through QM. Um, as a subscriber, you have access to the rubric. And I, my understanding, and I would certainly welcome um, other folks to chime in here, but my understanding is that um, you can't do an official review unless you have that training. But you... Um, but you do have access to the rubric, even if you've not been through the training, as long as you're a member of the subscribing institution. Stacy, thank you. Stacy says that's right. Um, there's a lot of there's it's 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 a lot to keep straight. <laughs> uh, Karen Watson has a, a verbal question. I don't. Does Katie have to give her? There we go. Hey. Um, I've been doing several uh, QM official reviews this year um, since the first of the year. I've done three. And then I did one unofficial one in December for another. And these are all for outside the state of Georgia. And the, the question about can you use your QM rubric even if you don't use a QM, I mean, that the other question is a few minutes ago. Well, the first review that I did was an internal review, and I was the subject matter expert. And so the review did not have the quality matter seal on it, but yet the institution got what they needed out of it. They needed to know where the classes stood. These last three. You know, once these instructors, you know, meet the requirements, they and then they will have the quality matter seal. So it, it's just a matter of whether or not your university wants that 
official quality matter seal on it or whether or not you just want to make sure your courses are up to par. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Well, we're past yeah. time. <laughs> we're over time. Well, we want to thank you so much, Karen, for, for talking about this. And to all